I actually got this question. Um, one of the first questions that I was asked, and one of the first questions that I didn't have an answer for, and I was a little bit like, how dare you ask me a question I don't have an answer uh -huh. for at the time. But you know what, it was a good question. And, um, and the question was, was very simple, how are you gonna upgrade Ethereum? Welcome to the Alpha Podcast, brought to you by Neverland Labs and hosted by me, Jussa, here in Buenos Aires. We're at the Polkadot Decoded Conference in Buenos Aires. This is a special edition. These episodes are unique because I'm co-hosting them with Jay, who has his own podcast, and we're kind of working together where we're co-interviewing people and switching things up. There'll be a version on his channel and there'll be a version on this channel. So make sure to check out both versions and we already know mine, it's gonna be better. I wanna remind you that everything you're about to hear is not financial advice, nor do we endorse any of the projects or guests on the show. It is simply meant for educational purposes and sometimes we're learning about these people or projects in real time. While this is brought to you by Neverland Labs, the opinions expressed are of mine, the guests, and also Jay's. I want to give a huge shout out to Polka House who brought us out here to make this happen. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy this series and let's tap into the episode. My name's uh, Gavin Wood. In recent years, I have uh, co-founded uh, the Ethereum uh, project, uh, founded the Polkadot uh, protocol. I've uh, founded a company called Parity Technologies and the Web3 Foundation. And I think, uh, I, think, I, I, think I can also add founding the Kusama protocol as well yeah. um, on there too. Uh, so yeah, uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of stuff. I kind of like to dive more into like, who you are as a person and less technical. I feel like a lot of the interviews, I would assume, are very technical yeah. stuff. If you don't mind, I would like to kind of get to know who you are. What were you as like a child? Were you always very techy or did you get good grades? Uh, I, got, I got pretty good grades. I wasn't super great at uh, history or geography. Uh, oh. they, were, they were definitely my weak points. Um, so yeah, so I grew up in a, in, a, in a small town in the northwest of England. I, I was born in a, in a city called Lancaster, which you know is uh, reasonably well known. It's kind of historical. It's got a nice castle. I, I didn't actually live there for um, several years in my childhood. I actually lived sort of outside it as I say, this like kind of old industrial railway town. It, 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 it's not a place that I go back to very often, let's say. Uh, um, Lancaster, um, Lancaster was where I went to secondary school. I actually kind of moved there full time when I got 17, just for a year before I went off to university. I was, I was pretty into Lego when I was like six, seven years old. Um, I, a, a sort of friend showed me their, their computer when I was, I don't know, maybe seven or eight. and. Um, you know, I kind of fell in love with this, this kind of machine that you could kind of program. Uh, of course, uh, I came from a pretty poor family. Like, we couldn't really afford a computer uh, back then. Uh, it's like the mid-80s. Um, but eventually, the guy across the road um, was nice enough to sell my mum, like, his old computer. It's just, like, Texas Instruments, TI-99 slash 4A. It's like, uh, you know, it wasn't a popular machine. <laughs> they, were, uh, they were good marketing then, yeah. huh? <laughs> Uh, I mean, they, they, yeah, it was basically as powerful as like what, one of these old calculators, but it was programmable. And this was, um, there were three games that, that sort of came with it and I, I got bored of all of them pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but uh, it had like the basic programming language on it. So I could um, uh, enter programs from like a, a, a manual and then eventually I just started coding my own stuff. As time went on, I kind of upgraded. I got like a Sinclair Spectrum. This was like a, uh, I don't know, this is more popular. This was pretty, pretty popular in the 80s. And then I got a uh, Commodore Amiga 500 and eventually I made my way to a PC and, and, and yeah. But like, yeah, as a, as a kid, I, I, I sort of, I, I was always into like building stuff, designing stuff, like constructing stuff. Uh, whether it was like Lego or, or video games, like computer programs. What did other kids think about you working on computers all day? Uh, you know, I, 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 I got a bit teased for, uh, for like, you know, uh, particularly in secondary school, I was a bit of a computer geek, but, uh, you know, it was kind of before geek became chic, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just like, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't super, uh, wasn't super cool, but like, thankfully it was, um, I went to a pretty good school. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal, like, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of geeks at my school, and I was definitely, um, uh, one of the more cool. <laughs> uh, I heard you also snowboard. Yeah, yeah. I, I picked this up when I was living in Norway. I kind of, um, I, I spent like six months in Norway mm, cool. back when I was uh, just uh, finishing up with a university. There wasn't much to do. I mean, winter <laughs> in, in northern Norway is, is pretty dark, cold, very expensive place. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't have that much money back then. Um, you know, I kind of done a job 
for a month or two I, I got a, like a bit of cash together and it was, I was just basically kind of freewheeling doing some of my own uh, some of my own stuff I had a sort of the idea of, of making a new um, uh, computer language in order to make this like uh, video game that I wanted to create and uh, yeah I mean <laughs> yeah, the rabbit hole of like yeah I want to make a project oh uh, in order to do this I need to make a new computer language all oh, right in order to do this I need to make a new like editing program like it, the rabbit hole went pretty deep and uh, I, I kind of got I never got around to the video video game put it that way uh, but uh, I was I was in Norway I was doing you know this stuff in the daytime and in the uh, yeah weekends and, and evenings it was like let's go let's go snowboarding like try it out and then uh, Luckily, there was a local mountain. I lived in a city called Lillehammer. It's famous for like two things. Uh, it has a TV show, okay. <laughs> apparently. Like there's a, a quite famous TV show called Lillehammer. It was about it was English language, but it was set set in this Norwegian city. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was some sort of police show. I never saw it, but but people have often <laughs> mentioned it to me. And the other thing is that it hosted the Winter Olympics back in the mid '90s. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So that's what I knew it from. I think it was '94 they hosted the Olympics. It has this huge like uh, downhill ski slope, like one of these, you know, this, the big ski jump. Yeah, where they could, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the it, big yeah, one. The yeah. really, really. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you can you can walk up to the top of it, like, fuck <laughs> off. I did that once. I did a tourist thing once. But otherwise, yeah, it was. It was I, I ended up like actually quite liking living there. Um, it was. It is dark, cold, and expensive. But it, there's a certain. I don't know. It's a certain coziness to it. If you're if you're living with some cool people, which yeah. I was thankfully, um, yeah, it was it, it was a it was a fun few months. I was born and raised in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is very uh, similar, I would assume, uh -huh. and known for its like one of the world's best ski resorts. So <laughs> I get the uh, the cold and <laughs> dark and just for tourism, it's very expensive there. Super, like uh, the co the cold really was incredible. Like uh, minus minus twenty five. Yeah. Like yeah. you know, you wash your hair before you go out, and you yeah. end up with like a headache. Just you you feel like your freezes. nostrils breathe, yeah. like a, you inhale, and you can feel it freezing as you're inhaling. Like bicycles coming off your. Yeah. Your yeah. I have those photos from December. <laughs> Here's Johnny. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, you, you're traveling loads these days right uh -huh. like I th you were just in Toronto my hometown uh -huh. at uh, Collision uh -huh. uh, you hit up New York in between uh -huh. I think you're jet setting off to Berlin next or? Uh, via New York then London then Cambridge ah. then yeah then Berlin uh, then uh, then actually off to Asia for the Korea uh, the Seoul blockchain week whoa um, right amazing so, yeah I, I, yeah I, I, I travel a fair amount so what do you think about uh, Argentina, Buenos Aires so far? So I traveled around Latin America. One of the things that I did before, you know, in my wilderness years, <laughs> as they say, <laughs> uh, I, I did, uh, I, I went through um, Central America. So I, I spent three months just like busing down from Mexico City down to Panama City. Beautiful. So yeah, a really, really nice time. A uh, lot of, lot of nice stuff. I mean, uh, so I really, I, I studied Spanish at school. Like I did five years of Spanish. Uh, my mum actually spoke um, Spanish uh, fluently. Oh. Um, so she also sort of taught me when I was a kid a bit. Um, so like, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, like, you know, time is such that I can't, I can't be, um, I can't keep it up to a, a level that I would like. But um, I always enjoyed uh, sort of coming into um, yeah. Spanish speaking world. I've also like, I've been like Central America, I've, like I say, I spent, I spent a fair amount of time. South America, a bit less so, but I have been to a, a few places like Brazil, uh, Ecuador, uh, uh, Guyana, strangely enough. Argentina, I, I really want to say, I mean, Buenos Aires is, you know, I mean, it's a big city. Yes. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, unless you get like deep, unless you live in a big city, it's hard to really get a feel for it on like a day, like just spending 48 hours in a place. Yeah. Um, you get a feel for the hotel maybe, but, not <laughs> much more. but the bit, the bit that I've, I've been around, like super nice, very chill, some nice cafes, some nice bars, like liking it so far. What I really would like to see and what I'm going to come back for is, is, you know, um, uh, exploring like the wider Argentina, go to like the uh, you know the plains. I want to go into Patagonia. I, yeah. I took um I went I was in Chile. Yeah, yeah. Do do a bit of summer snowboarding. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice. Uh, I was in Chile a while back, like uh, just before COVID hit. I was I was traveling around Patagonia there as well on the Chilean side. Um, super beautiful, and I I really want to see uh, I really want to see complete the, yeah. the picture. We want to see the Argentinian side too. It sounds like you've done a bit of traveling where. It was just free roaming and 
Now, like you walked in here with an entourage of people. Yeah. <laughs> this is the biggest entourage I've ever had, right? Is it? Uh, yeah, this, I, normally it's maybe maybe like one or two guys, but a lot of the time I don't have any entourage. But like, uh, yeah, this, this, I don't know, it's like 10, 10 guys. <laughs> Did you ever expect, I mean, you're pretty much a celebrity in this space, in this figure. Like, how does that, how, how does that weigh on you? And yeah. it's, a, it's a completely different, you're traveling, you have entourage people checking on you There's i don't know it, it's a mixed bag right there's it's nice to sort of feel uh, uh uh you don't get to feel lonely but on the other hand like there's there's a certain um uh you know a certain beauty and, and restoration in solitude yeah for sure. and um and you don't get to feel that much either uh in this with this kind of lifestyle but i do try and uh you know i always take time particularly if i'm like in um you know at home I lived in Malta last year. I felt a lot of solitude there. This kind of life, I don't. It's not like the whole picture. It's it's yeah. very particular for like when I do these, um, you know, particularly like big conferences. Yeah, when when I'm at home, it's it's I'm a, I'm a pretty like bit of a bit of a sort of home home body when I'm there. Like yeah. I like to cook pasta. I like to <laughs> I like to couch in front of the TV uh, nice, yeah. when I can. You know, yeah. I've, uh, I like to listen to music. I have a very nice sound system back in my place in Malta. I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of getting one in, in a new place in Lisbon. It's just like sitting on a comfy chair, listening to some very good music played very loud. Yeah, yeah I, no I, doubt. I get that. Well, in, in line with this idea of an entourage and the team around you, I mean, what we're building right now with me and some other people, we're kind of trying to build this production house, right? Encouraging people to make content and share what they're learning about Polkadot. What's the process of kind of delegating your work and decentralizing the team? How do you pick who to work with and um, how do you decide what they're going to be responsible for? Yeah, it's hard and I'm not, uh, I'm not the world's best delegator. It's, it's, not an easy, um, it's not an easy task, especially as someone that's sort of, you know, grown up and uh, very much had the mindset of doing things doing it yourself yeah. like you know I'm, I'm a coder like I've been a coder since I was like 8, 9 years old and uh, it's, it's everything that I always wanted to do and I'm really happy that I get to do it but it comes with like as someone that's been like you know building stuff themselves for like basically my entire adult life I don't find it easy to, to lead organizations I don't find mm. it easy to delegate and it's uh, I'm just lucky that some really great people happen to have wandered into my life Right. Um, that I feel super comfortable with and super comfortable just letting them um, letting them do their thing like, like letting them organize build have teams like uh, around them and most of the time especially in like later years this has gone gone down very um, uh, very well but like the only thing I can do is I, I know whether I, I have an innate sense whether I feel like comfortable around someone a comfortable like um, with someone like doing something, I get a very quick sense of this. I'm not so good at any kind of like organizational process uh. of like giving work out and checking <laughs> that it's been done and bringing it back again and coordinating between different, but this isn't my forte at all. Okay. But I do, I can like, I can within a, a pretty short period of time um, know whether uh, I'm, I'm gonna enjoy and have a productive uh, working relationship as well. Do you have like a moral guiding system that helps you make decisions? Because not only like with the people that you bring in and work with, but um, the, a lot of this technology that you're building has implications on tons of people's lives. I made this uh, quote, it's like, with great power comes great responsibility. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, that's a good one. I came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> to remember it. <laughs> uh, Sage, man. But yeah, is there like a, do you have like a moral compass or a guiding system, value system that you kind of lead with when you're building these things and, and creating stuff? Yeah, I mean, mostly I, I uh, there's a lot of, I mean, there's this great book, The History of Western Philosophy guy by a guy called uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, recommend recommended reading for anybody who what was that say it. Um, the history of uh, Western philosophy mm. basically it's it's uh, it's I don't know, it's got like 40 50 chapters like a thousand page book like a proper like Lord of the Rings <laughs> um, and it's uh, it's got it's got a chapter for every um, major philosopher um, in the last 2000 three thousand years That's in the West so it doesn't yeah. go into like Eastern philosophy yeah. uh, but like you know, well, all the way through like ancient Greece to like modern day, um, it tracks all of the philosophical like disciplines, thoughts, schools, 
and explains them as and they're particularly in the historical context. And one of the things that I uh, that I picked up, uh, you know, sort of when reading this book is that I, you know, I had a very instinctive um, sort of agreement with uh, the principles of like enlightenment. Uh, of the Western Enlightenment of um, enlighten, Enlightenment philosophy mm -hmm. these kind of like the principles of like you know liberal values um, of uh, accountability uh, coupled with responsibility of uh, uh, sorry accountability and uh, and responsibility kind of being the same thing and those being coupled with authority so it's like if you have the power then you need to be accountable you need to be responsible yeah, right? it needs to come with Needs to pair, the two needs to be paired. I think we do need some some guiding principles when we're doing these kinds of systems. Um, I think we need some um, circumspect uh, like consideration. We need to understand the sort of systems that have already um, that have already sort of come before. We need to understand like socio political systems to some degree, at least a, a good level of awareness. Uh, and yeah, you know, I, I do my best. And I, and I do my best not just to like uh, to, to to look around me to to research, uh, but also to listen when people have like you know to critiques and also to ask. You know, I, I I do you know I just did this talk. I didn't actually have any questions, but most of the talks that I that I do, I do try and like have questions at the end, and I do try and like encourage people to like think about think about the world around them and think about what I'm telling them. Like mm. you know question me because it's only by questioning me that I'm going to learn like yeah, yeah. And, and there have been there have been times right I mean I, thankfully I don't make too many mistakes on what I work these days I, uh -huh. I'm not I'm not I'm definitely not flawless and I've, I've I have made you know my fair share uh, but thankfully there have been uh, times where people have questioned what I've done and it's like yeah you're right and then think of that that's great, and what I've what I've eventually done has been substantially better because of that. Right, it's like priding on finding the right answer, not being right, yeah. and ultimately you kind of just drop the ego and like that's how you get to the right answer. <laughs> exactly. And I guess it's helpful that you know if you make a mistake with polka dot, we can upgrade it and change it, right? <laughs> I'm wondering, do you think you made any philosophical errors when you were designing Ethereum? I hope you're enjoying this episode. It's brought to you by Neverland Labs. We are a Web3 entertainment company bringing you the hottest and most entertaining stuff in the space. From media like this podcast to video games with West Coast Customs, the Meta Whips, the Meta Racers, and also bridging the digital and physical assets together and in real life events. We got season two of the Meta Whips coming soon. So make sure to stay up on that. Let's get back into the episode. There was a distinct desire to get something out sooner rather than later. Right. So we knew what we were doing was not going to be there forever. We knew it wasn't the, the final solution. Right. Um, and I definitely worked with the idea that this is like a tech demo more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit less of a tech demo than Bitcoin. Bitcoin really is a very much a tech demo. But uh, I mean, it's kind of outgrown. I, I don't know. Bitcoin, it hasn't really changed. Like, you know, it's got a lot more um, social backing now. But the, yeah. the technology is still like what it, what it always was. Like mm -hmm. there isn't much new to Bitcoin. When we look at like the amount of innovation that's happened in the space, much that's new to Bitcoin, which is, you know, part of its philosophy, perhaps. I don't know. But um, yeah, we, we, in, when we were doing Ethereum, um, we knew that like proof of work was kind of a shitty idea, but like whatever, we didn't have time to do a, a proper proof of stake before needing to launch. The idea was we upgrade a year later. We didn't really have too much thought about governance. I actually got this question. Um, one of the first questions that I was asked and one of the first questions that I didn't have an answer for, and I was a little bit like, how dare you ask me a question I don't have an answer uh -huh. for at the time. But you know what? It was a good question. And, um, um, and the question was, was very simple. How are you going to upgrade Ethereum? And this is when I went, uh, this was like back in February, I think, March 2014. So it's before we had a, a working test net. It was before the ice, before this crowd sale. It was before, certainly way before launch. And, um, and it was like, well, you know, people will just run a new version of Ethereum. And it's like, yeah, but how are they going to coordinate? They, they just coordinate amongst the, you know, I didn't have a good answer. Like, right, right. And, and at the time it, it was like, well, you know, maybe I don't need a good answer because, you know, this isn't the problem we're trying to solve right now. We're trying to, we're, you know, we're trying to get a smart contract platform out yeah. in, the, in the first place. We can make it upgradable in the, in the second place, maybe. 
But it's uh, it, it's worth it was a worthy question and it's worth actually having an answer for. And I think the lack of an answer and the lack really of any future plan to 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 to, to make an answer mm. um, was, I think, in some sense, uh, philosophically. Um, wrong attitude right. I think um, upgradability adaptability evolvability um, and because of it governance is not something that you can retrofit very easily yeah. and when people come along they say well we've launched the protocol yeah we'll just retrofit like web assembly we'll retrofit upgradability it's like I don't know maybe maybe these guys know something I don't but it seems to me that at least in my experience and drawing upon other protocols it's not something that you can retrofit. And oftentimes it's a philosophical um, point as well. Bitcoin, Bitcoiners are like, we don't want our protocol to ever change. Right. Oh, fine. Maybe yeah. that's, a, maybe that's a, a, a great attitude. I'm not sure it is. I think, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of technologists, if they say, I never want my technology yeah. to change, like, <laughs> pretty sure you're going to be out of a job pretty soon. <laughs> but, but yeah, fine, whatever. Bitcoin seems to be, seems to be hanging in there. So mm -hmm. fair enough. But like, um, I think a lot of, I think in general, uh, that th this was something, uh, the lack of governance, the lack of, of open and transparent process for making decisions at the protocol level was a philosophical I would question that philosophical decision now. Yeah. One of the questions I wanted to, to ask, so a lot of the content that I'm creating is to like also bring in people or help them understand kind of what Web3 is. So first of all, you, you, I read you coined the, the word Web3. I mean, so here's, here's the full story, <laughs> yeah. right? I think if you want to actually look up the first use of the term like Web3, yeah. um, he, would have, he would be using it for the semantic web. But this, the semantic web, like, I mean, I, I, not my thing at all. Not sure I rate it, to be quite honest. <laughs> like, I, maybe I don't know enough about it, but it, it, sound, it, it didn't sound to me to be especially, uh, uh, to be where the web was going, particularly. Oh. Or if it is, then maybe not such an important direction. But anyway, whatever. I think if you want to look at the, the specific, the word or, or whatever, WEB3, that's probably going to be an earlier mention. But I didn't know about that at the time. And in 2014, I wrote a, like a manifesto of like Web 3.0. This, as far as I know, is the first time, I mean, certainly I, I didn't know of it before I wrote yeah, this, yeah. that Web 3 was used in the um, less trust, more truth, crypto um, kind of uh, uh, blockchain definition that it has today. I think it's fair to say, yes, I did coin Web3 as it is defined today. Uh, that, that would be me. Like in your words, how can you explain to people who have no idea, like the mainstream people, how is Web3 going to impact their lives? Like how are, is it going to be a mm. part of their lives? I hope it will facilitate um, uh, agile uh, services that we simply wouldn't otherwise be able to create. Um, in the same way that like mobile devices and the internet like being ubiquitous allowed us to create services like humanity yeah, yeah, <laughs> to right. create services like you know Airbnb, Uber, all of these like grocery delivery services, get your groceries in ten minutes you know mm. this is this is something that is provided by um, uh, by virtue of like a much more peer based uh, transaction system mm. um, now it has its limits. Everything still has to go through a you know a centralized payment provider. Everything goes through a centralized service uh, like server uh, mm -hmm. that serves this stuff up. Everything goes through a centralized app store, and there are there are kind of trans like opaque limitations that we don't see because of these centralization aspects. Um, there are services that cannot exist because of these centralization aspects. And what I would hope is that we because we can reduce the transaction um, the the transaction friction ever further because we can reduce um, uh, the need to trust the individuals that, that, are do, that, are, that we are transacting with um, we can create ever more sort of interesting agile services and thereby you know create you know, more substantial more uh, innovative economic drivers um, at the back of society. Uh, one way you explain it uh, or you have explained it in the past is the services without the service providers. Uh, I really love that 
That's how I try to explain it to others now too. Cool thing about Polkadot and Kusam is that we have these parachains and they're all enabling new services. About a year ago, I think you were asked in an interview what you thought would happen when the parachain auctions started on Kusama. Uh -huh. And your answer was uh, chaos. I'm curious, what was your impression of what happened to the parachain auctions uh, in the first, let's say, couple batches? And uh, where do you think they are today compared to your expectations? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't. I don't like follow the parachain auctions super closely. Okay. Um, <laughs> like I've I've got like a, a hundred and one things to uh, keep my uh, keep my eyes on. And uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't. I don't have as much time as I would want to follow um, to follow this stuff. But um, like, I, obviously, I did. I did sort of keep an eye on the first uh, the first few auctions. Yes. And uh, I was pretty happy that like it it went down without too much. Uh, too much chaos. You, you always retain this like healthy fear that that you know you've made a mistake somewhere along the line that never got yeah. picked up in the peer review or the audits, <laughs> and um, and I was yeah I was I was just super happy that you know it's uh, uh, the economics seemed to work okay like peop like you know the price discovery mechanism was reasonable it was it was more or less um, uh, uh, you know working as we expected it to to do when we were sort of designing it mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and. You know, the code, again, didn't seem to have any obvious um, significant flaws. I think we will, over time, need to adapt to, uh, uh, to a different mechanism, particularly mm. as, uh, as we introduce more parachain, more parachain slots. Yeah. Um, and we have you know, various means that, we, uh, that we're looking into to scale Polkadot and Kusama, but to scale the Polkadot protocol um, and allow for many more um, you know, parachain, uh, parachains to coexist. Yeah, and uh, and I would hope that uh, you know we'll find uh, uh, different kind of mechanisms beyond uh, you know auctions are pretty good, but different mechanisms maybe fixed price uh, mm. fixed price slots, maybe um, longer term slots, maybe uh, mechanisms whereby the term of a slot can be um, is it is in and of itself something that you bid on. So you maybe say right, I want to bid ten years, but I'll pay a bit more in order to keep keep the slot going oh. like so I bid you know maybe you bid for like uh, you know because we often have teams that are like well you know I can only bid two years at a time what happens in two years maybe I can't afford to keep the slot Yeah. well you know we would hope that there's going to be a lot more slots in, in two years time but uh, overall I think uh, I would I would hope that we can um, move to like more innovative models maybe first refusal for like certain certain like fixed price first refusal so it's mm. like you know yeah, uh, in two years' time, if you want to keep the slot, this is the price that you will be able to keep it for. And you can get to know this ahead of time. Sure. This kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's something that we as a community, as like parachain community, need to like get together. We need to th understand the economic limitations at the end of the day. We don't want stagnation. We mm. don't want like crappy products tying up parachain slots just because they paid for a 10-year slot at the beginning and right. now no one's using them. <clears throat> People are using some other thing, but that's like only a para thread or it's, you know... Um, they're deploying on Kusama instead of Polkadot, or they're deploying on some other relay chain instead of Kusama or Polkadot. We definitely don't want to see this, so we need to keep the uh, we need to keep the ecosystem, you know, constantly reinvigorated. We need to use our whatever if the resources are limited. We need to make sure that the resources are uh, are used well. Right. And um, and this is part of why there is this two year renewal period. But uh, like I said, I hope in the future we can. Uh, especially as more and more parachain slots become available, we can look into sort of different ways, different timelines mm -hmm. of um, of pushing forward. They're yelling at us to, to wrap this up. <laughs> There's a lot of oh, waving really? going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> your time is very valuable. So Everybody wants something. I have a quick follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, it's not on me. <laughs> Ten minutes. How do you think? Kusama is shaping up philosophically. Like, do you think there's enough chaos going on? Are people moving fast enough? Are they trying to break things enough? In short, I would say no. Ah. I do not think it is. It is. Um, it is being. I, 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 rather, I think. I think there's plenty more experimentation it can do. And I do. I do hope in my limited capacity to influence where the network goes. I, I hope to really advocate 
for more experimentation. One of the things that, uh, that, that has happened, it wasn't something that I foresaw, and it's not something that I necessarily think is a good idea, is that teams um, oftentimes launch two networks. They launched their parachain on Polkadot and a parachain on Cosama. Yes, yes. And Cosama was meant to be an experimentation, a protocol that experimented, and if it went down it, for hours or days or whatever, it wasn't meant to give any guarantees. It was really meant to be this place for trying out new things mm -hmm. and shrugging your shoulders if, you know, if, if shit happens. Um, like, you know, it's part of the game. And I think as long as, like, I think as more and more parachain teams deployed their sort of canary networks as a Kosama network, as yeah. a Kosama parachain, they expect Kosama to actually be, have, have uptime, have 100%, like, you know, have certainty of uptime. Right. And this reduces the ability that Kasama can experiment if it's now a platform allowing other people to, to, do, to host their experiments. The host of an experiment cannot themselves be an experiment, right? right? right yeah. Like mm. you need, if you're doing experiments, you need equipment that is reliable. <laughs> uh, it's unfortunate um, that it's sort of, uh, that it's come out in this and it does work a little bit against what Kasama was meant to be for. That said, you know, whatever, I, I'm not, I can't, I can't tell people to use parachains, lots of water, or other. They're, they're there to be used. But I, what I would say is that we as the parachain, we as the Kusama community need to, um, you know, need, need, need to be, uh, need to examine what Kusama is here for. It's, it is yes. an experimentalist network. It is here yeah. to try new things. And it's here to support people trying new things as well, right? The Kusama treasury is there to like fund cool shit that might not work yes like, yeah yes. that's what it's for cool um and i and, and it's there to like make people aware also of like kusama is an experimentalist bed it's you know let's try new things let's 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 build crazy stuff and yeah. some of this crazy stuff a lot of it's gonna gonna be like nonsense like it's not gonna work <laughs> but some of it's gonna be amazing right that's the that's the bet and the, right. the, the bet is that like experimentation in and of itself is valuable right Polkadot can't be that expert that you know it's it's that it's a really it must be a reliable protocol for it to have that's you know it's it's credibility as a, yeah. as a you know as a as a forefront running platform but mm -hmm. well as a, as a major platform but like Kusama doesn't need to hold itself to that sort of conservative uh, ideal you know people have talked to me hey we need a we need a canary network for Kusama, Kusama. <laughs> it's like no man come on. is this is this really the direction we want to go do we really want to have like two polka dots and then another? Right, yeah like, I, I, I'm not convinced like I think mm. I think um I think we can afford to be a bit more liberal and a bit more like uh, a bit more rock and roll yeah. on Kusama. Where that you want people to follow you and learn about you more? Uh, Twitter, uh, Gav of York. Uh, that's my handle since I was a student at York. I'm in the Polkadot water cooler. So that's where I, if, you know, if there's like a, a, a general chat room that I hang out, that's where I hang out. You can get it on Discord. It's on Element as well. I use the element one, but there's like a bridge there, so it's mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. And uh, you know, some of the governance chat rooms, I chime in. You know, I want to open this up a bit more. I think uh, Parity's forums are going to start to be a more public, so people can uh, we can sort of chat about uh, polka dot technology, substrate technology. Um, Great. You know, more like in a more community oriented fashion rather than like having this weird barrier between Parity. But this is something that's kind of an ongoing. Uh, process. Fantastic. Well, I'm super grateful for your, your time today. We have, I'm sure we both have more questions that we could probably so do. So many more. Guys, he just did a huge <laughs> talk on governance 2.0. It's crazy. So we'll have to connect again at, at another one. I know there's going to be the, the world tour and... Let's do it. I mean, so. uh, yeah, wherever I'm going to be in, like, I'm, I'm in Cambridge, like I said, uh, I've got to go to, I'm in New York, uh, next, I'm speaking at New York Decoded tomorrow. That's yeah. amazing. Uh, I'll be in Seoul for the Seoul Blockchain Week. Yeah. I'll be in Tokyo for the uh, there's a there's a Tokyo thing going on. I think there's like a, a gaming summit or something. Interesting. That, uh, that I'm gonna they're gonna be speaking at, and then for sure they'll I think um, possibly unfinished as well later on in the year oh. in New York. I think that's September time. So. There's uh, plenty of opportunity to. Uh, we'll have to set something up. up. Go yeah. go snowboarding in the mountains of. <laughs> it's a it's a <laughs> date. It's a date. Like, <laughs> Defo. Uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you know. so much. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Uh, great, great chatting. Cheers. Awesome. Safe travels. Thanks. 
you did. You did fantastic. I wish we could talk more, but yeah, soon, no, soon. Uh, there was some really good stuff to uh, to chat about that. We were really trying to like go into things that not everybody is. No, this this is one of the best that I've had actually. It really is. So, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Make sure to like, subscribe. Thanks for watching or listening or wherever you're at.